Good evening. Give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. I always wonder. Okay, wonderful. Welcome to Salem Lutheran Church and School. I am Pastor Amy Barsh Odal. I am so glad you are here for our Good Friday worship service. We continue on the Zoom platform. Please keep yourself muted. We will have special speakers later on that will unmute themselves, but we ask everyone to remain muted otherwise. Uh, this worship service is being recorded and it will be available later on our YouTube channel. Life and death stand side by side as we enter into Good Friday. In John's passion account, Jesus reveals the power and the glory of God, even as he is put on trial and sentenced to death. Standing with the disciples at the foot of the cross, we pray for the whole world as Christ's death offers life to all. We gather in solemn devotion, but always with the promise that the tree around which we assemble is indeed a tree of life. We depart silently tonight as we wait. It is Friday, but Sunday is coming. Here at Salem, we believe there is no person or created thing outside the active love and grace of God made known to us in the person of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Almighty God, look with loving mercy on your family for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed, to be given over to the hands of sinners and to suffer death on the cross who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading is from Isaiah chapter 52. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which he had not, they had not been told, them they shall see. And that which they had not heard, they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form, no majesty, that we should look at him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our iniquities and carried our diseases. Yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole. And by his bruises, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is sent through the slaughter and led like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice, he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him, the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish, he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. 
The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the intercessors. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to, to God. God. Our psalm is Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why so far from saving me, so far from the words of my groaning? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. Yet you are the Holy One, enthroned on the praises of Israel. Our ancestors put their trust in you. They trusted, and you rescued them. They cried out to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not put to shame. But as for me, I am a worm and not human, scorned by all and despised by the people. All who see me laugh me to scorn. They curl their lips they shake their heads. Trust in the Lord. Let the Lord deliver. Let God rescue him if God so delights in him. Yet you are the one who drew me forth from the womb and kept me safe on my mother's breast. I have been entrusted to you ever since I was born. You were my God when I was still in my mother's womb. Be not far from me, for trouble is near. And there is no one to help. Many young bulls encircle me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their jaws at me like a slashing and roaring lion. I'm poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart within my breast is melting wax. My strength is dried up like a pot's herd. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth and you have laid me in the dust of death. Packs of dogs close me in. A band of evildoers circles around me. They pierce my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones while they stare at me and gloat. They divide my garments among them. For my clothing they cast lots. But you, O oh Lord, be not far away. O oh my help, hasten to my aid. Deliver me from the sword, my life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth. From the horns of wild bulls, you have rescued me. I, would I will declare your name to my people. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, give praise. All you of Jacob's line, give glory. Stand in awe of the Lord, you offspring of Israel. For the Lord does not despise or abhor the poor in their poverty. Neither is the Lord's face hidden from them. But when they cry out, the Lord hears them. From you comes my praise in the great assembly. I will perform my vows in the sight of those who fear the Lord. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Let those who seek the Lord give praise. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of nations shall bow before God. For dominion belongs to the Lord who rules over the nations. Indeed, all who sleep in the earth shall bow down in worship. All who go down to the dust, though they be dead, shall kneel before the Lord. Their descendants shall serve the Lord, whom they shall proclaim to generations to come. They shall proclaim God's deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying to them, the Lord has acted. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our next reading is from Hebrews chapter 10. The Holy Spirit says, this is the covenant I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sin and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through a curtain, 
that is through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray together. Holy Christ, 2000 years after your crucifixion, we still betray you, still deny you, still forget your resurrection promise. 2000 years after your crucifixion, our world still clings to fear, still disregards justice, still resorts to violence. Have mercy on us, O oh God. Now and forever, amen. It is a testament to the in incomprehensible power of God that a device of torture has become a symbol of ultimate love. The foot of the cross is holy space because it speaks about deep truth, about humanity, and about the deep truth of God. The cross reminds us that we as humans are capable of pettiness, of injustice, of violence. We grasp for power in ridiculous and dangerous ways. We let fear control our actions and our interactions. The cross assures us that God desires intimacy with us so deeply that God became human. God did not just look human. God did not just hang out as a human for as long as it was convenient. God in Jesus of Nazareth became really fully human, so human that he died on a cross. And so it is at the foot of the cross that we can most clearly see our need for God. It is at the foot of the cross that we can gaze most intently upon God's love for us. At this time, we are going to have a dramatic reading of the Passion. If you are able to on your uh, device, if you set the view to speaker view, you will be able to see all of the speakers highlighted. If you are not able to do that, it's still you'll still have a full experience of our dramatic reading. I would also like to say thank you to all of those who are participating and have practiced this reading for this evening. And speakers need to remember to unmute themselves as well. Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. John. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees. And they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? 
They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again, he asked them, Whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. I am not to drink the am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First, they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, Are you not also one of this man's disciples? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it, warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. And Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it, and at that moment, the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, 
we are, are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? And Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone to you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourself and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die, because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and the power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, you would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out. If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have, we have no, no king, king but, but the, the emperor. emperor. 
Then he handed him over to be crucified. So they took Jesus and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on either side with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let, Let us not tear it, tear it but cast lots, lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing, they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother, and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. 
After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission. So he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified and in the garden, there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. As you stand in the shadow of the cross, may the darkness guard your heart with love. May the chilled air fill you with holy breath. May you rest in the peaceful uncertainty of knowing that things are not as they seem. It is Friday, but Sunday is coming. Amen. We depart in silence. <laughs>